So we are going to be doing You know, and the chemistry that we're doing is very basic. It's like, what are atoms and molecules and how are atoms connected up in the molecules and how are atoms rearranged from one molecule into another kind of molecule and things like that. You know, we are not getting into the more subtle parts of chemistry, um, but you do need to know the kind of the, the basics, the fundamentals. You know, what makes a sodium different from a chlorine and how would a sodium and a chlorine connect together versus a, um, I don't know, like a hydrogen and a carbon, things like that. So we're going to talk about stuff like that. Um, you know, this class also kind of gets into basic physics as well, the basic concepts of fluid flow of blood through your cardiovascular system or air coming in and out of your lungs or oxygen diffusing across the alveoli into the capillaries it's all about basic physical processes and basic physics and you know bulk flow and things like that so you know while yes we're talking about the human body at the core of it it's kind of more basic science that is kind of defining how things actually happen. So let's, you know, matter, which is the stuff, you know, and then there's energy. Um, we will be spending a lot of time getting in more detail about the, um, Where's my colors? There they are. We'll be getting much more into detail about matter, about atoms and molecules and all how that works. Let's spend a few moments first, though, talking a little more about energy, because um, that's also going to be another underlying theme throughout this semester. What is energy and what are the different forms it can takes and it can take and how are those forms interconverted between each other? So, what is energy? What is, I mean, you all been in chemistry. What is, what is, when we talk about energy, what are we talking about? Somebody. Is it the ability to do work? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Ability to do work, right? It's, you know, it's, it's a little, you know, less easy to grasp than like matter, which is stuff. You can pick it up and poke it. Energy is this ability to do work and it takes different forms. And it's important that you are familiar with the different forms that energy can take. So let's look at this in more detail now. So energy. Um, what are the two broad categories that um, energy takes? Is uh, kinetic energy and uh, potential? Exactly. You know, kinetic versus potential. Kinetic is energy of motion. Anything that is moving has kinetic energy, right? One half mv squared gives you like the amount of energy in joules if you've taken chemistry. Um, right, so if something is moving along, you know, this pen is moving along and whack, it can hit my hand and makes a little sound or you know, I can have this hand is moving, it has kinetic energy. When it hits my other hand, that kinetic energy got transformed into sound energy, which you heard as a clap, kind of a little sting as my other hand felt this thing collide into it. So you can take kinetic energy 
and it does stuff, you know, moving things, whack into other things and make things happen. Potential energy is a little, um, a little more subtle. What is potential energy? Um, is the energy that, um, like, I don't know how to explain it, but like your body uh, tries to store it and then um, yeah. it's going to use it later? Yeah, no, you, you, you said it exactly. It's the energy that is stored. It's not actually currently doing something in the moment, but it has the potential to be converted into, you know, kinetic energy and do something, you know, physical in the world. So potential energy is going to be really important in this class and understanding all the different ways potential energy um, can be stored. So let's dive deeper now into potential energy. Um, so what are some of the different ways we can store energy? What are different forms of potential energy? You mean potential energy, how is it like stored in the body? Yeah, but how, how is it stored? For us fat, right? Um, a okay. glycogen. So, okay, so good. So fat, glycogen, things like that how where is the actual energy stored how do you actually release the energy from fat or glycogen or atp i mean atp is another molecule that has energy stored well it gets to us a dehydration right and then you have to right so so when you do if you do what well, well, actually hydrolysis, hydrolysis. When, you break, when you break things, break things apart. So we can have it stored in chemical bonds. You know, and when you break those chemical bonds and rearrange the molecules, you can release that energy, right? That's what's happening. You know, I've, I've got a variety of different um, different samples I've kind of tried to try to um, do here. Let me, I'm going to stop this here for a second. Um, right here, this is lighter fluid. Lighter fluid has its molecules, it's these hydrocarbon molecules carbons and hydrogens and oxygens. And in this moment, it's not doing anything. It's just sitting as a liquid in a can. But you put it in, you give it a little spark, get the reaction going. And now all of a sudden, we're releasing that energy stored in the bonds. We're converting the that lighter fluid, that naphtha or whatever it is, into carbon dioxide and water and then a lot of light and heat is being released as the, the energy is the form of the energy now is light and heat. But it used to be stored in the chemical bonds of the hydrocarbon molecules that are the lighter fluid, right? You know, I have like other things. I have, you know, cellulose. Cellulose is also, it's basically carbon and hydrogen and, and um, oxygen and it's put together as wood or paper. And in this case, it's been nitrated to make it a little more um, fancy, but I can like, right? It's like all that energy was stored in the chemical bonds. And then all of a sudden it was released and it was, in this case, it was making light and heat sound. But, or if in your gas tank, you put, you know, octane molecules and you can move a ton of steel 30 miles across the land with a gallon of this, you know, you know, this gasoline. So in our body, um, a lot of, you know, we're going to be doing a lot of this, like, you know, sugar, sugar cube, your sugar has a lot of energy stored in the molecules. And if you release it, you can do all sorts of work. Um, in our case, or in our body, 
rather than doing a more dramatic burning and light and fire, we're going to have a more subtle way of capturing that energy to do the stuff that our cells need to do. But this idea of energy stored in chemical bonds is going to be a recurring theme in this class. So, so using the example of the lighter fluid, the, um, the chemical bond would be the lighter fluid and then the container that it was in would be like a muscle cell. And then when it lights up, that would be the ATP molecules. No, 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 no. Um, ATP is yet another just way to store. So oh, that would be the storage still. Right. So C6H12O6, this is glucose. Yep. So this has energy stored in the chemical bond. So like during cellular respiration, which we take this, you know, plus 6O2 is going to become 6 carbon dioxide plus 6 um, H2O, you know, plus energy. You know, in this process of going from sugar to carbon dioxide, water, and energy, this could just be combustion. This could just be lighting the sugar on fire. Okay. Uh, which is releasing the energy, but not in a useful way for your body. Instead, we're going to be going much more into detail in the mitochondria in your cells and showing how we're going to release the energy from this, but then we're going to actually capture it and store it in you know, ATP. ATP, which is adenosine with three phosphates on it. That's adenosine triphosphate. You know, and this is another molecule that has a lot of energy stored in it. But we'll see it's very useful because it's very easy to transfer the energy into other, other um, reactions. Like the process of taking a sugar molecule and getting the energy from it is really involved. We're going to spend an entire lecture, like an hour and a half, just talking about the details of how your cell takes the energy stored in a sugar molecule and captures it in a useful way. ATP we can describe in like 30 seconds, right? ATP, you have the adenosine, It's got three phosphates connected. These phosphate groups are on it. And if you take this and you break it apart in one step, one step, I mean, So this is now ADP. This is ATP here, adenosine triphosphate, because it's three. This is diphosphate um, for two. And then this one here, usually we put the lone phosphate group with a little sub, sub um, I, because I means inorganic phosphate, because it's no longer connected to a um, organic molecule. But this thing here, ATP, goes to ADP plus inorganic phosphate plus energy. This we are going to see constantly. Um, and it's because it's really easy to couple this reaction to other reactions and use this energy to run all sorts of stuff in your body. Um, you know, the, they talk about it being the currency of energy, meaning, meaning, um, like for instance, I have my specialty, I can teach. And if I wanna get like groceries, maybe I could go find somebody who owns a grocery store and I could tutor their kids or something. And then in exchange for my tutoring, they would give me groceries and that would be one way to, you know, use what I've got to get what I need. But instead what happens is I work for the College of Marin. I teach in a very specific way. They give me, you know, where is it? Yo, 
I get my money, you know, and then this is now something that I can just take to a grocery store and give it to the person and they accept it as meaning something and they give me food and then they can take this and then they can give it to somebody else and get what they need. So it's a way of transferring value in a much more um, convenient and universal way. So the ATP is kind of like that. Like to take sugar and use the energy, release the energy in a useful way from sugar is really complicated and involved. To take the energy that's stored in ATP and use it in a useful way is super easy and super, um, super flexible. So we'll be seeing ATP coming up constantly, whether it's about changing the shape of things or pumping things or running chemical reactions that don't want to <clears throat> run with, you know, run on their own. Anytime you need like some energy for something, you know, ATP is there to kind of help you along. Um, so ATP, and again, where is the lion's share of the ATP produced? Mitochondria, right? Exactly, in the mitochondria. We're going to be spending a, a lot of time looking at the detail of how do your cells actually make the ATP. Um, so again, we're still kind of riffing off of this idea, potential energy stored in chemical bonds. Again, we'll be seeing sugar, ATP, um, other things like electron carriers like NADH. Um, I'll talk about that in a little more when we start talking about redox reactions. But there's a lot of um, potential energy stored in molecules that have these kind of electrons in these high energy states. And then when you have these redox reactions, oxidation, redu oxidation reduction reactions, where the um, electrons are transferred to a lower energy state. You can capture that energy that's released to do useful things. Those are going to be really important in the body as well, the redox reactions. Um, okay, so potential energy, chemical bonds. That's just one of the many ways potential energy is stored. What's another important way potential energy is stored? Somewhat. Is it through um, Kelvin cycle or um, um, glycogen? <laughs> so those are all examples that are still in this category of chemical bonds, right? So we're going to get into like the Krebs cycle and all that, but that's all going to be about working with potential energy stored in chemical bonds. There are a few fundamentally different ways of storing energies that do not have anything to do with chemical bonds. Um, You know, what is what am I drawing here? Spring. This will be a spring. And what happens if you push down on the spring? It bounces back up. Yeah. So this a uh, spring that has been kind of um, kind of kind of pushed together like this. At the moment, it's not doing anything. This is storing potential energy, but then if you let it go, it's gonna spring and it will get longer and do something. So we can store potential energy as mechanical energy. Um, example of this, I actually have 
This is an antique revolver, an old, like, it's like a 120-year-old Smith & Wesson. It's a, you know, it's like one of these old cowboy movies. And you have the little, little hammer you can pull back. Right now, it's pulled back and it's not doing anything. It's just waiting for something to happen. And if I pull the trigger, then we release that stored energy and then it flies forward and hits the back of the bullet and fires the bullet or whatever. So you pull it back, it's cocked. It now has a lot of potential energy stored in this just mechanical spring. Then I pull the trigger, boom, it flies and does something, right? Now this is how your muscles work. Your muscles work, you're gonna have the myosin heads are gonna get pulled back and they're in this cocked position. They're ready to go, but they're not doing anything. And given the appropriate trigger, in this case, it's gonna be calcium coming in and freeing up the, you know, the binding spots on the actin, the myosin head grabs on and snaps and it generates the force in your muscle. So that's another example of potential energy that's going to be important in our class is this idea of this mechanical potential energy. Some It's usually happening on a dinky scale, like some molecule, but molecules are little things that you can move and then let them snap back. So potential, mechanical potential energy is going to be important for our semester. But wait, there's more. Um, and actually, I realized, could you see that? It was in the corner there. Could you see that when I did that? Okay. Um, so now, what are more, more ways to store potential energy? Isn't like, so there's the spring and then isn't there like a, the ball? Like a, the ball form? I feel like it is, I don't know exactly, but I feel like I remember something like that. Something about like a ball, like if you drop a ball, it bounces back higher or something. So is that would that be like gravitational? Like, so gravi like gravity? So okay. So gravity, so if I have a hill and I have a ball, here's my ball. If it's sitting at the top of the hill, it's not doing anything. If I like let it fall, all of a sudden I'm converting this potential energy with respect to gravity. And I can convert, so as long as I'm lifting it up higher, it's kind of storing energy. And when I let it fall, I convert that energy back into kinetic, the motion energy. Again, I've got, you know, if I, um, again, I, here, here I have water. Water, which is higher than this glass. And... I let it fall. And do you all see that? The water goes and starts turning into the kinetic energy, energy of motion as the water is moving and falling down into the glass. And I can get clever. I can, like here, I, I made like a little wheel here and I'm gonna pour the water over the wheel. Do you all see how now I was using the falling water in the little wheel and getting clever with my mechanics here and spinning things around and like that. You know, so we're going to have stuff that's very similar to this going on in the body, although not quite with gravity. Gravity in general is not going to be one of the main ways we're going to see potential energy. Um, but we're going to see things that act in ways that are similar that are going to, this is going to be a good metaphor. Um, so actually, and one second, I got to dry off my desk here. Um, all right. Um, so gravity, you know, in general, gravity is not going to be that much of a theme in this class unless you trip and like hurt yourself <laughs> because gravity took you down to the ground. Um, but let's talk about some other more potential energy, more forms 
of potential energy. So uh, another, I'm going to just give you two more that are going to be really common and important throughout the semester. One is potential energy stored in concentration gradients. So concentration gradient. So imagine I have some membrane here. And I have some stuff dissolved in the water. Pretty much everything in our body is going to be in an aqueous solution dissolved in water. So let's say these are sodiums or protons or who knows what. They, we're going to see concentration gradients of all sorts of molecules. It's some kind of molecule or atom. And I got a lot over here and not many over here. So gradient means that there is a change from one side to the other. There's a difference. So a gradient, so there's a difference between the two sides. So in this case, there's a lot over here. There's not many over here. I know that you've spent a lot of time learning about diffusion in Bio 110. What, what happens in diffusion? Um, it will be the higher concentration to a lower concentration. Exactly. So if I open up a little a little gate to let these through here, these want to go from high to low. And we're going to talk about this more detail in a few moments. But in general, just passive transport, diffusion, things want to move from higher to lower concentrations, and they do it. And as they do it, you can capture that flow of, of molecules it's very similar to the way I use that little pinwheel in the flow of the water. Um, we're going to see little membrane proteins, literally, that do look like little like paddle wheels that spin around and do useful work as ions flow back across a membrane or as, you know, so as, so whenever you have this difference, more of something on one side versus the other side, you have potential energy because you can allow it to move and then capture that energy as the flow moves from one side to the other. So like I said, even though this idea of potential energy with respect to gravity isn't really that useful in the body, the metaphor, thinking about the flow of water with a paddle wheel, that's very relevant. When you think of like little molecules flowing down their concentration gradient and then capturing that energy to do useful things in the cells. So we'll see a lot of that. Um, so that's yet another way we're storing potential energy stored in stored in molecular bonds, stored in um, we talked about with respect to gravity, stored mechanically, stored in concentration gradients. And there's one last important um, form of potential energy that we'll be seeing a lot of, and that is energy stored in electrical gradients. So the idea here is similar. You've got like some membrane, something that separates two sides. Um, a lot of, you know, what happens if you take a sodium atom and you ionize it and it loses an electron? What, what are you left with?
If I have anything and it loses an electron, what am I left with? Um, proton. Ion. Ion. Say that one more time. It gets a positive charge. So say that louder. I, I didn't. I didn't hear you. Becomes a cation. It becomes a cation. It becomes a positively charged ion. If you have now more protons and electrons, you're going to have a cation. So we're going to have a lot of cations that we're going to see. You know, and if you have things that take on extra electrons, they become anions. So we're going to, this is going to actually be very important when we look at signaling in the nervous system or in muscles and all sorts of excitable tissues. We're going to have separation of charge across the membrane. So one side is more positive, one side is more negative. What that means is now if I take, I take, let's say I take a, I don't know, a potassium ion. If I have a potassium ion just sitting here, which direction would, does it want to go based just on the electrical properties? It would want to go to the negative side. Exactly. Opposites attract. It is going to want to go from this side to this side based not on any concentration gradient, but just based on the electrical properties. If this is a positively charged entity, it's going to want to move towards the more negatively charged side. Um, this is going to be really important as we again as we get into all sorts of signaling within cells and in neurons and all this, you know, and again, you can do work as things move. Like again, another, uh, another example, you know, it's like, oh, look, batteries, batteries. These are basically what I just talked about. They are set up. So you have, in this case, rather than ions, it's electrons really want to move from one pole to the other pole just because of the chemical structure of this thing. And if you allow them to actually flow and they go through the filament of a bulb, they do something useful and they light up. And, you know, that's just basically allowing the charges to flow and do work as they go from, you know, the side they're at to the side they want to be on. So that's going to be super important as the semester goes on as well. This idea of, you know, so again, potential energy. We talked about in chemical bonds. It can be mechanical. It can be with respect to gravity, although this is not going to be that, that, um, relevant for our semester can be in concentration gradients. Sometimes we call them diffusion gradients. Um, these electrical gradients. Um, the separation of charge we call a voltage. The voltage is the word for electrical potential. Um, we're going to talk much more detail about um, voltage and how we define voltage and what's a positive versus a negative voltage, particularly with a cell. Um, but whenever you see this word voltage, it means, by definition, electrical potential. You know, a three volt battery versus a nine volt battery, you know, a nine volt battery is going to have a higher electrical potential and it's going to be able to do more work as the electrons move from one pole to the other side. Right. Um, so any questions about potential energy? It's going to be an ongoing theme till the last day of our class. So you really need to kind of 
make sure you feel comfortable with the idea of potential energy and the ability to convert it into forms that are more useful that, you know, whether, you know, usually kinetic or things like that or heat, things like that. So um, can mechanical also be called elastic or is elastic something different? Elastic okay. would be something different. Okay. Um, I'm not exactly sure where that term is. I, I th it's To me, it sounds like a form of mechanical energy, you know, because like a rubber band or something is definitely mechanical. Kind of like a spring. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so any other questions about this stuff? Okie dokie. All right, so now we're going to move on to matter. You know, the stuff. Um, what's the, it, it, we should say, it, it can take, there's solid, liquid, gas, you know, there are other things, there's plasmas and stuff, especially when you get to non-standard temperatures and pressures and stuff. Don't worry about that. For our class, everything's going to be solid, liquid, or gas. Um, in all cases, what is the building block of matter? What do we use to assemble to make matter? Atoms. Atoms. So atoms, and what are the building blocks of atoms? Protons, neutrons, electrons. Yeah, protons, neutrons, and electrons. Right, and if you get deeper into chemistry or particularly into particle physics and stuff, there's all sorts of subparticles and all sorts of crazy things that go on. That's not for the purpose of this class. For this class, you can think of three subatomic particles, the protons, the electrons, and the neutrons, um, and molecules made up of atoms that have relationships with these kinds of things. Protons have a charge of plus one. Neutrons are neutral. Electrons have the charge of negative one. Um, and how do I, you know, and again, we should also just put them together in a, you have the nucleus, which has the protons and the neutrons. And then kind of in, you can think of them in an orbit, um, or it's more of a, you know, so you get more into it. It's like a probability density cloud. You got the little electrons. I usually draw electrons as E sub E superscript minus. That's kind of the classic way to write an electron, because it's E for electron minus for a minus charge. Um, so this is a classic atom, um, and they're small. The a typical atom is you know on the order of like one angstrom. An angstrom is 10 to the minus 10th meters. So there, that's like one one hundredth of a, of a, what's one, no, one tenth of a billionth of a meter. It's, it's really small. They're really small. Um, what determines whether, so I just drew, this is my atom. How do I know if this is a sodium atom or a chlorine atom or a lead atom or whatever atom? The number of protons? Yeah, the number of protons. So, you know, if I go, let me, um,
you know, the old classic periodic table of the elements. If you look on the periodic table of the elements, you know, that number, that six for carbon, that is the number of protons that make up a carbon atom. No matter what else, no matter how many electrons, protons, whatever, if it has six protons, it's carbon. Um, if it has 17 protons, it is a chlorine. Um, over, we go over here to the little alkali metals. If it has 11 protons, it is a sodium. If it has 12 protons, it's a magnesium. So that's going to be important as we go on. You know, the number of protons by definition defines what element it is. If you change that number, you're changing it into a different element. Um, electrons, on the other hand, are are a little different. So let's say I'm talking about sodium. And sodium is Na. You, and we're going to be using sodium so much. You def, If you're not comfortable with Na being the um, abbreviation for sodium, it's like, I think, Latin for natrium. You make, make sure Na in your brain just instantly translates to sodium. Um, so in the nucleus of a sodium, I'm going to have 11 protons. Um, usually about 12 neutrons. We'll talk more about that later. And then zipping around the outside in my little electron cloud, I'm going to, let's say, 11, whack, 11 electrons. So this would be kind of a neutral sodium atom. Um, sodium, though, tends to like to ionize. Um, does everybody, everybody should know what we mean by valence shell of, a, of an atom. It's the outermost shell, you know, and there's the octet rule. Like a atom is most stable if it has, you know, eight electrons in its valence shell. Assume, unless you're like hydrogen, in which case it's two. But in general, like sodium only has one valence electron. And it tends to let go of it really easy. So when you put sodium in water, that electron just disappears. And we end up having 10 electrons on the outside and one electron went off to find its destiny someplace else. So now I have 10 electrons on the outside, but I have 11 protons inside. So what is the overall charge of this thing? Plus one. One. So this is gonna be Na plus. It's going to be plus one charge because it's got one more proton than electron. This is what I'm going to call a cation. Right, cation just means a positively charged ion. You know, we can another example would be like chlorine. If I'm looking at chlorine. Um, the nucleus in chlorine is, let me double check, it's um, 17 protons. You know, and how many, it, you know, 18 or 19 neutrons, it doesn't matter, we'll talk about that later. Um, and then I have 17 electrons if it's just a neutral chlorine, but chlorine has seven electrons in its valence shell. So it tends to grab an extra electron if it can find it um, and incorporates it. So then it becomes 18 electrons. So now I have this thing that has 17 protons, but 18 electrons. So what's the overall charge on this puppy? Negative one. It's negative one. So this is gonna be a Cl minus, um, an anion. So this is going to be really important for this whole semester, this idea of ions. 
you know, there's cations that are positive. There are anions that are negative. Um, some things ionize with just a single electron. So like we're gonna like I mentioned here, if you have sodium, sodium, we're never gonna see Na as just Na. Na is always gonna ionize and be Na plus. Potassium we're gonna use all the time. Potassium, which is a K, ionizes also plus one. It'll be K plus. Um this is another letter you need to know. This is potassium, if you're not familiar with it. You should get to the point in your brain where you just see K plus and you don't even translate. You just know it's potassium ion. Um, we'll be using them constantly, again, for the next four months. Um, other, other important ions ionize with two. Like calcium, when calcium ionizes, it has two electrons in its valence shell, and calcium is going to become Ca2+. Plus. Or you could, some people write it like this, Ca2+. Plus. I tend to do it with like the double plus, but it's the same deal. Magnesium is the same thing. Magnesium becomes magnesium 2+. Plus. So you're going to see both of these as well. So these ions are going to be super common. Um, anions, chlorine is going to be the main one that we're going to be seeing through this, through the semester. So Cl minus. Um, these are the main charge carriers. So electricity, electric current is flow of charge. You know, the stuff I have in, you know, in the battery in this flashlight here that's making the flashlight light up. That's a flow of electrons going through the wires, making the light like heat up. Um, most of the electricity like in the electronics you're used to that's coming out of the wall or powering your iPhone, it's that's flow of electrons. In the case of that kind of that's electricity, flow of charge, but it's flow of electrons. In your body, the, f the electricity is flow of charge, but it's flow of ions. So this is going to be, you know, the electrical current in the body. When we talk about electric current, when we talk about voltages, all this kind of stuff, we're going to be talking about charge separation of ions, charge flow of ions. So it's, if you're not super clear on what an ion is, you need to be. Um, it would be like if you were starting to take a Shakespeare class and you didn't really know what a noun or a verb was as we got started trying to analyze the subtleties of the poetry or something or what a syllable was or something, right? You can try to analyze iambic pentameter or whatever. So ions, I do know that some people aren't that familiar because I watched, I looked at the um, those quizzes. So if ions are not like in your wheelhouse yet, make sure you get really comfortable with them because they're, they're gonna be constantly in your, um, Kind of thinking about how how neurons are communicating, how muscles are being excited, um, things like that. Even how how are how is the how do how does the egg block the subsequent sperm from getting in after the first sperm has fertilized it? You know, it's going to be about calcium ions. You know, it's till the very end of the semester we're going to be thinking about ions. Um, so, any questions about what exactly an ion is? Um, so, neutrons. So, it is possible to have a chlorine, and if we put 19 neutrons, would it still be a chlorine or would it be something else? It'll be something else. 
isotope, right? So it would still be a chlorine, though. Oh. Right? As long as there are 17 protons, it's a chlorine. Right? So this is important, but you are correct. Amato mentioned this word isotope. It is a different isotope of chlorine, right? So the number of neutrons can give you different isotopes of the same element. Um, you know, in the case of our class, we don't really care that much about isotopes. Um, there are certain isotopes that are stable, other isotopes that are not stable, where the nucleus starts breaking apart spontaneously. You know, the only reason, you know, in a clinical setting, you actually do care about, you know, unstable radioactive isotopes. They're used for, for imaging to make different, um, or used for radiation to, um, like for cancer therapy. Um, you know, so using radioactive isotopes are actually useful in a clinical setting. Um, but in general, we're not gonna really be worrying about isotopes that much. Um, although the isotopes are, it's important to think about, like when you, um, if we go back to our periodic table here. So let me zoom in even a little more here. You know, if I look at potassium here, it says 39. So the 39 is the you know, the atomic weight or atomic mass of this thing, which is, in, it's going to be important when, we, when we're converting um, grams to moles or moles to grams, we need to know, this is basically how many grams of this atom make, or this element make a mole of this element. And, but it's also the sum total of, you know, all of the protons and the neutrons. So if I have 39, if I know that there's 19 protons that make up a potassium, then I know that there has to be 20 neutrons that meet to, you know, add up to 39. If I look at sodium, there's 11 neutron, 11 protons. That means there's got to be 13 neutrons that make up basically 23 as the atomic mass. But then you get, like if we look at, we're going to be spending a lot of time thinking about chlorine. And you look at chlorine and it says the atomic mass is 35 and a half. You know, there are no atomic, you know, subatomic particles that weigh a half. Why is it that the atomic weight of chlorine is 35 and a half instead of like 35 or 36? This number is an average, right? Exactly. So this is an average of the naturally occurring isotopes. So it means like about half of the chlorines out there have 18 neutrons, about half of them have 19 neutrons. And if you have a handful of them on average, it's going to have a value of, a, of this. So that's how you get these non whole numbers for these atomic mass, atomic masses there. Um, but yeah, these are the numbers you're going to use. And again, when we're not going to be getting really deep into stoichiometry and stuff in this class, but you should understand the basics of the relationship between moles and grams and how this number is, is the key to convert between the two. Um, Okie dokie. All right, so now we have talked about atoms, the building blocks of matter. You know, and sometimes we will be just looking at individual atoms or ions. We'll actually spend a lot of time just looking at K pluses or Cl minuses or Na pluses or Ca plus pluses or H plus. I should mention when you have an H plus, a hydrogen ion, a hydrogen is just a proton and an electron. So when you ionize this, you're left with just a proton. So when I have an H plus, I will 
interchangeably say proton or H plus, it's the same difference. It's like saying my coat or my jacket or my feline or my cat, right? It's like proton and H, H plus are the same, just two ways to say the same thing. It's just a naked proton. Um, and these are going to come up a bunch in our class. They're going to be playing all sorts of important roles. Even in our lab today, you know, we're going to be talking about measuring the, what is the, um, what is the way we measure the amount of protons, the concentration of protons inside a solution? Molarity. Um, but more specific, so measuring concentration in general, you do molarity, but for H plus concentration in particular, what is the way we we note denote that? Is it the pH? Exactly, it's the pH. So we're going to spend quite a bit of time in lab today going deeper into the idea of pH, which is basically a measure of the proton concentration in the solution. Right, pH is just minus log proton concentration. That's just by definition what the pH is. And we'll look at this in much more detail and see how it behaves and all that when we get into lab a little later today. Um, so after molecules, though, we start assembling the molecules into, not, I'm oh, sorry, I just spazzed. Um, I'm going to edit that out and I'm going to go back to this picture here. All right, so atoms, after atoms, we now are going to assemble more than one atom and create molecules. So let's talk about molecules and how you make molecules and the properties of molecules. So this is going to be two or more atoms. And there's going to be this chemical bonding. Chemical bonding, which is some kind of like sharing of electrons. So it's important here to remember, if I have like an H2O, it's not like, oh, here's an H and here's an O and here's an H and they're just hanging out together. Right, this is not what a molecule is. H2O is not an H and an H and an O sitting next to each other. There is this real intimate intermingling of the electrons in between that create this more stable single entity. So H2O, there's going to be this intermingling of electrons that are being shared between the atoms. And let's talk about the different types of chemical bonds and how they're similar, how they're different. And that's, again, this is another thing we're going to be looking at in much more detail in our lab today. So what are ways that you can bond atoms together to make a molecule? You can oh, share bonds. What's that? I said covalent bonds. I don't know if you were talking about the type of bond. Yeah, no, covalent. So covalent is one of the important ones. So let's look at this to start with. So covalent bonds. This is a sharing of electrons. And electrons, you know, spend... spend time basically visiting um, you know, more than one atom. So like an H2O, the classic example, oxygen. I have oxygen. Oxygen has six electrons in its valence shell. But it wishes it had eight. It's got like this longing to be completed, it wishes that it had eight electrons in its valence shell. Um, if I have a hydrogen, 
Hydrogen has one electron. Um, hydrogen has a, um, the one S um, is its valence shell. So it actually needs two electrons to fulfill its, its valence shell. So it has one, but it wishes it had two. Oh, if only it had two for its complete valence shell. So they make this deal. Like this electron spends some time with the oxygen, sometimes with the hydrogen. This electron spends some time with the hydrogen, the oxygen. So this thing becomes an H2O. These lines are representing a pair of electrons that are spending some time with one, sometimes with the other atom. And this is a stable configuration. It kind of stays like this. Um, you can get a covalent bond if you take a carbon. You know, this is um, methane. Carbon has four electrons. It wishes it had eight. Each of these hydrogens can now share an electron. And now they're both happy. Both the carbon sees eight. Each of these guys have a filled valence. You know, so this is the idea of covalent bonds. There is this sharing of electrons. The electrons spend some time with one, sometimes with another. Um, however, there are different flavors of covalent bonds that are very important to understand. Um, does anybody know how a water molecule is different from a methane molecule in terms of its chemical properties? Is it the hydrogen bond? Or one is nonpolar? Exactly. So polarity, polar versus nonpolar. So this is, so covalent bonds can be what we call nonpolar. Nonpolar, these are completely symmetrical. No matter which side you look at this thing from, there's no excess of positive or negative. You know, the reality, it's not flat. It's actually, it's like a tetrahedron. But regardless, no matter what direction you're looking at this from, you can't be on one side that feels more positive and one more negative because whatever direction you're looking at, it's completely symmetrical and the positive and the negative is symmetrically distributed around this, this, this molecule. So this is called a nonpolar covalent bond. Um, and again, this is going to be essential when we start getting into solubility in water and stuff like that. So we're going to bring this back in a big way in a few moments. Water, on the other hand. So these electrons that are on the oxygen actually go sit on one side. This is what we call like the lone pair of electrons. And it turns out that you've got this kind of preponderance of negative charge here. It actually bends, it pushes the, the um, hydrogens away from where those electrons are. And you get this, what is it? I think it's about 107 degrees or something. I forget exactly what it is, but it's not linear. A water molecule is bent. Whenever we draw water molecules, we always draw it in this bent kind of looking thing. And where the electrons are, there's more negative charge. Where we have less electrons than these extra protons, we have a more positive charge. So this is what we call a polar covalent bond. It's polar because one side is more positive, one side is more negative. You know, overall, it's neutral, right? So I should, you know, you know, overall, right? It's not an ion. An ion is genuinely a charged atom, a charged entity. If you step back far enough, the charges balance, but they are more on one side negative and more on one side positive. So this is 
a classic kind of polar covalently bonded molecule. You know, and again, polar because it has two sides. A pole, a pole is like a side. North pole, south pole, right? Um, so does that does that make sense? Um, we can talk about, we're, and we're going to come back. To, where was the time? We're, okay, we're doing all right. Let's talk about another kind of um, molecule that's bonded in a very different way. What's another classic, a classic bond? I think I just said it. Ionic. Ionic bonds. So in ionic bonds, rather than having this sharing of electrons, you basically have one atom completely give up, ionize an electron and another atom completely take on that electron. So like the classic example here is table salt, right? NaCl, table salt, sodium has one electron in its valence shell, which very lightly holding on to. We talked about how it ionizes very regularly, very readily. Chlorine has Seven electrons in its valence shell. It wishes it had one more. And basically what happens when you have these hanging out, this electron is given up. It comes over here. This is now an Na plus. This is now a Cl minus. So there's not sharing of electrons. This does not know where its electron went. It just knows that it's positive now. This does not know where its electron came from. It's just negative. But what do we know about opposite charges? They attract. They attract. Opposites attract. So these are now pulled to each other, and they hold on to each other. That's an ionic bond. They are held together because they're opposite charges. Um, the thing, though, that's very different from covalent bonds if I have a covalently bonded molecule like water or sugar or something like that, it is an actual entity. Made. If I have H2O, let me go to another page so I don't confuse you. If I have H2O or I have sugar, C6H12O6, these kind of stay intact, you know, as... Um, individual kind of entity. You know, these carbons, hydrogens, and oxygens, they are your sugar molecule. These H2Os, they hang out as your water molecule. Um, ionically bonded things are super different. So in ionic bonding, you get a crystal lattice. You know, you've got your sodium, you know, and the chlorines like to hold on to it. But, you know, chlorines just, you know, the chlorines come around it because this is more positive. But then you have sodiums come in that are going to get attached to there because they want to be near something that's negative. So you just get this big crystal, this crystal lattice. The sodiums and the chlorines assemble in this big crystal lattice, but the sodium is not attached to any particular chlorine and the chlorine is not attached to any particular sodium. This sodium has no idea where its ionized electron went. This chlorine doesn't know where it got its electron from. It's not like these mated for life when they exchanged electrons. It's like this chlorine is just going to be Attack, attracted to, to anything that's positive. And this sodium is going to be attracted to anything that's negative. So this is going to be super duper important. We're going to be looking at this in our lab later today. When you put things that are ionically bonded in water, it's going to be really super different than when you put things that are covalently bonded in water. Um, 
it's going to be different on many different levels that are going to be very important for our class in terms of electrical behaviors, in terms of osmotic behaviors. So it's really important to actually know whether or not things are bonded ionically versus covalently. Um, in general, in fact, let me go back, share screen. You know, back to the periodic table. In general, things that ionize really easily tend to become ionic bonds. So things in this first column here, these are these, al what are the alkali metals? Like lithium, sodium, potassium. If you have something that has an Na, a, a K, it's very likely that you know these that this little one here this little one says it only has one electron in its valence shell which means it's really loosely holding on to its outer electron and it's very likely to let go of it when it's starting to do interactions um calcium magnesium we have that little two that's two electrons in the valence shell those are also very likely to just ionize the acceptors, on the other hand, if we go to the halogens, like here, chlorine. Chlorine has seven electrons in its valence shell. It's very likely to want to just grab an extra electron. And so like sodium chlorine, sodium chloride, you know, it's even if you didn't know by heart that it's ionically bonded, knowing that it's something from the first column and the second to last column, you'd be pretty, pretty um, sure that it's an ionic bond, right? Again, the noble gases, the thing with eight electrons in the valence shell, those are the things that are super stable, that don't like to make any kind of interactions because they are happy as they are. Um, so... Ionic bonds, where are we? So I'm gonna finish this up now by adding in one last kind of bond and then bringing in the idea of water and then we'll take our break. So let us So we've talked about covalent bonds. This kind of sharing of electrons and this could be polar or nonpolar, which is going to be super important in a few moments from now. We talked about ionic bonds. Now these are always polar, right? These are kind of the extreme of what we'd call polarity. There's things that are plus and minus, like pure charge, pulling on each other. Um, and now what is the one other kind of bond that we are going to be needing to understand for this class? Hydrogen. Hydrogen bonds. So these are going to be a, a different kind of class. You know, these things that I drew here, these, you know, connect, you know, atoms into molecules. Hydrogen bonds, on the other hand, are things that kind of hold separate molecules together. So attract separate molecules or sometimes um, connect different parts of a large molecule. And what do I mean by that? Think about think about DNA, right? DNA, the double helix where you have, you know, you know, the A with the T and the C with the G. Those are hydrogen bonds that are connecting the nucleotide pairs there. Um, 
obviously these are a little less permanent. These, you, you know, you can unzip a DNA and zip it back together. Um, so hydrogen bonds. Hydrogen bonds are what hold water together. So hydrogen bonds are just basically electrostatic attractions. So let me go and let's look at this in more detail. Let's look at water. I talked about H2O. Oops, let me actually draw it differently. H2O having a more positive side and a more negative side. And if I have another water molecule floating in the water with this, this has its more positive side, its more negative side. And there's another water molecule floating in here and it has its more positive side, its more negative side. And what happens is the more negative part of this water molecule is attracted. These are my hydrogen bonds. Note I'm drawing it in a kind of dotted fashion. This is, this is looking a little messy here. Let me try this again. When I'm drawing covalent bonds, I'm using these solid lines. These are my covalent bonds that are connecting the H's and the O's together to make a individual water molecule. But these dotted lines here, this is my hydrogen bond. This is just an attraction between two separate water molecules that are keeping them, you know, sitting side by side. But it's not a permanent chemical bond. It's, it's still two separate water molecules, but they're attracted to each other, right? Um, my water. How come the water molecules are all sitting in the glass here instead of just flying into the air as steam right now? Because they're harder to break down? No, it's actually, it's, it's what I just mentioned here. They're all holding on to each other. All the water molecules are attracted to the other water molecules by, by the hydrogen bonds, so they all stay in a big clump. It doesn't mean they're not moving around, right? This hydrogen bond here might break and then all of a sudden, like, you know, this oxygen is going to be now with this one. Think about, you know, think about a bucket of magnets, right? A magnet has a north and a south pole, but you can clip them together. You can pull them apart. But if you have a bucket full of magnets, it's still going to stay in one big ball. And if you shoved your hand and you try to move the magnets around, they'll shift and one magnet might disconnect from one, but it'll connect to another one. And you're still gonna have a big ball of magnets, right? Does, does that make sense? Right, so a glass of water is like a ball, it's like a big ball of magnets. Each H2O is still gonna stick together in a big glob, water glob, because each water molecule doesn't want to like totally let go and be free. It, it wants to, it's getting attracted to the polar, you know, complementary polar side of another water molecule. So does, does that make sense? Um, you know, when you heat water molecules up enough, they get enough energy. You know, heat is just energy. We'll talk about heat in much more detail, but temperature, high temperature, just means lots of energy, kinetic and rotational, translational, um, and they'll break free finally, and they will go into the air, and that's when they have. That's when you get like steam instead of instead of liquid water. So you know, and if you cool them down, they have so little energy; they're not bopping around. They just settle into a, you know, you know the ice is just when they're not even shifting. There's instead of a shifting thing of magnets, the magnets are all just sitting still plopped on top of each other. Um, so, does this make sense, what I mean by the water molecules hydrogen bonding to each other? 
So we are going to call water a polar solvent because it is made out of molecules that are polar that then are attracted to each other by hydrogen bonds. And that is going to be super important because pretty much everything in your body is dissolved in water. And you are going to have to really kind of get an intuition for what does it mean to be a polar solvent and what will dissolve, what won't dissolve. And let's see. So for our last, our last thing before we take our break, let us talk about some of these molecules we've talked about, these polar and nonpolar, covalent, ionic. We're going to put them into water and see what happens. So, again, the water molecules are, have these hydrogen bonds that kind of hold them together. And now I'm going to put in, let's say I put in a covalently bonded molecule. How about sugar? So C, C6H12O6, this is glucose. Um, glucose, when you look at it, it has this kind of ring structure. It's got these hydroxyls and stuff. I'm not going to get into the detail of it, but basically it has an oxygen that is got a lot of kind of negative kind of stuff going on. Whenever you see a hydroxyl, an OH, Hydroxyls are actually O and an H, and it means you're going to have kind of minus and you'll have plus. So whenever you have hydroxyls hanging off a thing, that's a clue that this thing is polar. So glucose, this is a polar covalent, covalent molecule. Covalently bonded, I should say. It's got these oxygens, these hydroxyls, whatever. So it is a single entity, right? Single entity, but it has charge imbalance. Whoops. Right? There's some parts of it that look more negative, some that look more positive, even though overall it's neutral. Overall, it is a single neutral entity. But if you come up close to it, there's going to be parts that have a predominance of more positive or negative charge. And what's going to happen is that is going to make hydrogen bonds with the water. The water is going to do this little dance where, you know, this oxygen here, it's like, oh, this is nice being here connected to another water, but, ooh, it's kind of cool now being, making a hydrogen bond with this part of this sugar molecule. And some other water molecule over here says, oh, oh, this is cool. I can make a hydrogen bond with this part of the sugar molecule. So this sugar molecule is going to go and do this dance, this kind of, you know, electrostatic attraction. The positive sides are going to be more attracted to the negative sides of other things, and the negative sides are going to be more attracted to the more positive sides of other things. So this is going to dissolve because each of these water molecules has just as much fun having these hydrogen bonds and having these kind of electrostatic attractions with the other water molecules is with each other, right? If you have a sugar, sugar crystal, then the sugars are just kind of holding on to each other. But when you put it in the water, the sugar is like, why limit myself just to my neighboring sugar molecules? It's cool to do this more complicated dance with all these water molecules, right? So, a polar covalently bonded molecule dissolves in water. This is super important to, to kind of keep track of right here.
polar covalently bonded molecule dissolves in water. Um, we, we say if something likes to go into water like this, we say it's hydrophilic, water loving. So we would say like, you know, glucose is hydrophilic. It likes water. You put it in there and it will dissolve and make hydrogen bonds and go into solution here. Um, what happens if I put something that is hydrophobic into, um, into the water? So a, a nonpolar, so I'm going to, now let's go into, like oil. It wouldn't dissolve. So oil has these long hydrocarbon chains. Um, this is going to be nonpolar covalent bonding. So if I put oil molecules in here, is it going to want, and if, if it's nonpolar, is it going to want to do this dance with the water molecules? Right, the water molecules all are holding on to each other because of these hydrogen bonds, these electrical attractions between the more negative and positive sides. What happens if I have a bunch of oil molecules which have no positive or negative side? Remember we said nonpolar means it's totally symmetrical. There's no charge imbalance. Does this oil molecule have any inclination to join the dance with the water molecules? No, they'll stick together. Yeah, and if you look at the water molecules, they have no inclination to join these. There's nothing attractive about these to them. So the water molecules hang out with the water molecules and the oils just get kind of pushed off to the side. So we say this is hydrophobic meaning water fearing, right? You've seen this. If you put oil and water together, the oil separates from the water. Um, I should mention it's a little, um, a little inaccurate to say water fearing, even though that's the word we use, hydrophobic. We'd say oil is hydrophobic because it looks like it's afraid of the water. It looks like it's running away from the water. Right, if you put oil in water, the oil separates from the water. But it's not actually running away. What's happening is the water is just dealing with itself and the, the oil is just getting excluded and pushed off to the side. Right, it would be like, um, like an example, it's kind of harder to do in Zoom land here. But like, let's say everybody in our classroom, let's say we were in real, real time and everyone's in a big group hug, you know, this big kind of cuddle puddle where everybody's just hugging everybody else. And it's just like a big mass of writhing humanity, except we all decide, you know, I'll say Lily because I know Lily. Um, Lily is dead to us. You know, it's like we we're going to just, you know, going to pretend we don't even know her. We don't even see her. We don't hear her. And everybody else is in this big cuddle puddle all, you know, and she's going to end up getting pushed out to the side. And you, it might look like she's like afraid, like she's avoiding us, but actually it's just, we don't even know she's there and we're all like pulling on each other. That's more what kind of what hydrophobic is. Hydrophobic, these things that are nonpolar, just get kind of excluded because the hydrogen bonded stuff all kind of pulls on itself. I was, yeah, cause I, I don't like the word hydrophobic cause it makes it sound active. It makes it sound like the nonpolar things are avoiding, but it's more they're getting excluded. Um, yeah, and yeah, so yeah, thank you for, for that being in that thought experiment, Willie. I didn't, I, it, it's, it's purely, purely being silly. Um, all right. Does, does that make sense? All right. So 
You know, if you put oil in a nonpolar solvent like gasoline, so let's say gasoline, and I, so gasoline molecules, these are all just sitting on top of each other, but they're not attracted to each other by, by hydrogen bonds. They're just kind of sitting on top of each other. And there's, there's certain things holding, but let's not get into that. What happens if I put a nonpolar thing like oil into this? Will it dissolve? Yes. 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 It will because basically the oil molecules and the gasoline molecules, nobody cares who is who. So they all just start spreading out, you know, kind of equally through. Um, if I put some sugar in here, sugar crystal, what would happen? Would it dissolve? It would dissolve. Why? Because like dissolves like. But what it, what is sugar? It's hydrophilic. It's hydrophilic. It's polar. Sugar is polar. We just talked about. So when you put the sugar molecules in here, the sugars are saying, I'm going to just stay holding on to my fellow sugar molecules. This gasoline, there's no charge imbalance. It's nonpolar. So there's nothing interesting. So the sugar crystal just stays intact, just mm -hmm. falls to the bottom and sits there as a sugar crystal. It's not gonna dissolve no matter how much you stir it, right? So there is somebody mentioned this idea of like dissolves like. Meaning, you know, nonpolar things Are going to dissolve in a nonpolar solvent. Polar things need a polar solvent like water to dissolve. And if you mix it up, things don't dissolve. If you put a nonpolar like oil into water, nope. If you put sugar into gasoline, nope. You know, but if you put, you know, sugar into water, it's like then you've got something going. Or if you put oil into the gasoline, then you've got something going. So this is an important concept. Um, this is all, I mean, I don't know if maybe it doesn't exist anymore. Back when I was a kid, one of the like really stinky things people could do to each other is, put sugar in their gas tank, somebody's gas tank. You know, why would it be really lame to put sugar in somebody's gas tank? Well, if it sat at the bottom, then wouldn't it clog it? Yeah, so it doesn't dissolve. So basically you have these little rocks that then can get sucked into your intake and grind up your pistons and stuff. I mean, I think probably more modern Modern engines are better at filtering stuff and all that. But basically, if you put sugar in gasoline, it's just going to stay as little little crystals, little rocks. Um, all right. The very last thing, I realize it's taking a little longer, but I want to do the one last thing to complete this thought. And we're going to put an ionic. We're going to put salt in water. So what is going to happen when we take my ionically bonded thing and put it into water? The salt will dissolve in the water because they're both polar. Exactly. It's definitely going to dissolve because it's polar. 
but something more intense in addition is going to happen. What is going to happen in addition to just dissolving? So it definitely dissolves. Will it change the water, like the balance of the water or the molecules? Um, what happens is, remember the sodium and the chlorine, they're holding on to each other just because of their charge difference. They're not holding on to each other in the more classic covalent bonded way. Right. Remember, we said it's actually not even a single cl sodium chloride. They're all connected together in this spring lattice, crystal lattice. So when you put this in the water, this sodium, it doesn't. It's like, why should I care about chlorine? I'm just caring about negative stuff. So the sodium is going to like start making hydrogen bonds with these. And a chlorine is like, oh, my God, there's so much more interesting stuff here than just being in a salt crystal. So the sodium and the chlorine doesn't just dissolve, it also what we call dissociates. So now all of a sudden, instead of having individual sodium chlorides, we have independent chlorine molecules, chloride ions, and so these are all independent. So that's what we mean by dissociates. Right? When we put sugar in the water, sugar dissolved. Like if I have sugar, it's going to dissolve, but it's not going to break apart. It's going to stay as an intact sugar. But if I put an NaCl into the water, not only does it dissolve, but it dissociates, it breaks apart. And now where I had one NaCl, I now have two particles floating around. This is going to be essential when we start looking at osmolarity and osmosis and all of that. So take home messages here, which are going to be part of our lab today. When you take an ionically bonded thing like sodium chloride and you put it into water, it does dissolve. But more than dissolve, it dissociates into individual ions. Which is going to have two effects. One is it's going to increase the amount of dissolved stuff. Um, when we get to osmosis and osmolarity, this is going to be critical. If you have one mole of sodium chloride that you put into the water, you're going to have two moles of ions floating around in there because each mole of sodium chloride becomes two moles of actual particles because it breaks apart. Every one NaCl becomes two separate ions. The other thing is we have free charge floating around now. Remember I talked about ions were going to be how we have electrical current in the body. If you have ions chlorides, sodiums, and stuff floating around in water like this. This now means that this water can conduct electricity because ions can flow from one side to another side. So this can now conduct electricity. Again, because electricity is moving charge. And we have these charged ions now that are freely floating that can move, move from one place to another. Um, we are going to see this in detail in lab in a little bit. So I realize I've kind of gone a little farther, talked a little more than I um, passed our 930, but I do, I did, I, this is kind of a good stopping point right here. Um, so questions right now. Again, you should understand, you should understand the basics of atoms molecules, covalent, which can be polar or nonpolar, ionic, um, and then we talked about hydrogen bonding, which is more between molecules or between parts of a large molecule. We talked about kind of water as a solvent. 
basically anything that's a polar covalent or ionic is going to dissolve, You're going to be hydrophilic. Although ionic is going to be fundamentally different in that it dissociates, so you have conduct electricity and also increase the amount of particles because of the dissociation. Nonpolar, on the other hand, is not going to dissolve. It's going to be hydrophobic. Um, and then we also talked about that idea of like dissolves like. That's kind of the nice little mnemonic when you're trying to remember what dissolves and what polar things dissolve in polar solvents, nonpolar things dissolve in nonpolar solvents, and nonpolar things don't dissolve in polar solvents. Like fats are nonpolar, they don't dissolve in water. Um, however, they can get through the phospholipid bilayer. And we're going to talk about certain signaling molecules that are lipo lipids that can move across membranes easily, but they can't dissolve in the plasma are going to need special carriers to move around in the plasma, which is mainly water. But once they get to the cell, they can move through the lipid of the cell membrane without any help, whereas polar things are going to need special channels and things like that. So understanding this idea of like dissolves like is going to be important. It's going to tell you whether or not things can move across membranes with help or need, if they need help or not, whether they can dissolve in your blood's plasma easily or they need help or not. So it's, it's all going to be really important to kind of keep these thoughts in mind as we continue on through everything. So when, like I mentioned earlier, these aren't just like, okay, oh my God, we're past the chem review. Let's get on to physiology. This is at the core of physiology. So you do, this has to make sense for the later concepts to make sense. So if this is, you got it, then that's awesome. If you're kind of rusty on it, you might want to dust it off. If you're really kind of lost, you need to put in the time now to get solid on it so you don't start falling behind. And so just putting that out there. And again, that's what office hours, that's what we're going to talk about tutoring, that's what all the other resources available are. So any questions? Yeah, I have a question. Uh -huh. um, how do you know the polarity on the ionically bonded molecules? Are they always polar or are there some nonpolar ones? No, they're always like kind of polar with a vengeance because they are separate charges that are kind of being attracted to each other. So it's it's kind of it's kind of the yeah the extreme of polar because instead of being a neutral thing that you know if I have sugar you know overall it's neutral but there's parts of it that are more negative and parts of it that are more positive if I'm looking at it from the outside but if I have salt it's like a pure positive and a pure negative sitting next to each other that then can break apart. So, so it's kind of the extreme of what polar would be, I would say. This is overall neutral. This thing is actually two separate ions that are just kind of pulled together by their opposite charges. Right, this is like charge and balance versus pure charge. Or net charge, whatever. Um, yeah, so that's good. So salt and sugar will both dissolve in water because they're both polar. But again, they'll dissolve in different ways. This will dissociate into separate ions. This will maintain as separate sugar molecules, but that will do this hydrogen bonding dance with the, with the, with the water molecules. Um, Right? If I put one sugar molecule into water, it stays as one sugar molecule floating around in the water. I put one salt molecule into the water, it becomes two separate things independently doing their own thing in there, which can then conduct electricity, increase osmolarity, all this kind of stuff. Um, other questions? All right, so let's um, take a break.